Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second Atom webinar. Today, we'll be giving you a sneak peek of some of the features coming up in the 2.2 release. My name is Dan Galeen, and I'm here with Sarah Romke today. Hi, everyone. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of what we'll be covering today, we're going to give a quick introduction to Atom in case there's anyone watching this who's not familiar with it. Then we'll go over some of the usability enhancements that we've made in the 2.2 release. After that, we're going to show you how in Atom 2.2 you can generate full binding aids in either PDF or RTF format. We'll look at the jobs page where um, these binding aids and other tasks in Atom can be generated asynchronously. Then I'll pass the session over to Sarah and she'll show you our premise 2.2 upgrade and how premise rights can now be made actionable on digital objects. If you have questions throughout the session, feel free to type them into the chat window and we'll address them at the end of the session. So for anyone who's unfamiliar with Atom, Atom stands for Access to Memory. It's a web-based, open-source application for standards-based archival description and access in a multilingual, multi-repository environment. We're not going to spend too much time today talking about this today, but we have a lot of resources here available, including a recording from a previous webinar that's available on YouTube. If you search Atom Introductory Webinar, you'll find it. We have a full hour session that covers all the basic features in Atom. You can also check out our website at accesstomemory.org or our user form. We have a demo site at demo.accesstomemory.org where you can play around with the previous release, the 2.1 release. So with that, let's get started and take a look. Can somebody just confirm for me in chat that you guys can now see our screen? Okay, great. So here we are on the Hadam homepage. First thing that you'll notice is we've done a quick redesign here of the header bar. Previously, the browse button was attached to the edge of the uh, global search bar, and there was no actual search button. We found that that wasn't very useful for some people who are familiar with the more traditional thing, and that this way, the interface is actually more touch friendly, where you can actually hit an input. And it's clear that the browse button is separate from the search functionality. Otherwise, the functionality is the same. If we go to our Browse Archival Descriptions page, the first thing you'll notice here is that we've added a top-level description filter here. So now when users arrive on browse pages, they'll see only top-level descriptions, regardless of level. So in this case, we actually have some item level records that have no parents. So you can still see those within the top level descriptions. Ball and collection can also be viewed at the same time. We can easily remove this like this. When users do searches, they'll still arrive on a results page that shows all levels by default. But the uh, level of top-level description filter will remain available. So if you want to limit your search to just top-level descriptions, users can easily do that. Another thing that you'll notice is that we've added back a feature that was available in the earlier IC Atom features, which is a link to parent-level descriptions shown in the search results. So here I'm looking at an item level record and I can see that it's part of the Ronnie Shepherd fault and I have a link directly to that. We've also adjusted the thumbnails so that they'll be less cropped. 
uh, in previous things, they were limited by um, height and width, and that often we found that heads were getting cut off. So we've adjusted the way that thumbnails display so that users are getting a better image of what the actual digital object looks like and losing less content. Let's take a quick look now at some changes to our archival institution. If I select an archival institution here, I can show you that we've done an overhaul of the holdings section of archival institutions. Previously, the holdings section would only list the uh, top 10 results. Now we've tied the number of results to the global settings for number of results per page. We've added a pager, and we've added the ability for users to browse all um, holdings in a full browse page. So I've opened that in a different tab here. Let's switch over quickly and see. When I click that, I come over to um, a browse page of archival descriptions that are limited to top level descriptions and to the particular repository that I'm browsing. In this case, the Archives of Ontario. Going back to the page, we'll just take a quick look here at this. We've developed this feature with Ajax so it's very quick and easy to navigate to. Users can also input a value in search. The page will jump very quickly. If I try to type letters in here or a number that is too large, the value will just reset to the current page. Finally, we've added a full text search bar to the holdings that will be limited to the current institution's holdings. I search here, again, I'll be taken to a full um, search page, but limited to the current um, archival institution. Once again, I have all the facets available, so if I want to only have conduct my search in the top level, I can use the top level description filter or any of the other facets available to me. We're going to quickly look at one small here. One final adjustment that we've made here, which I will log in for now. This will be of interest to archivists interested in um, both the PDF finding aids and in um, exporting records in EAD XML. One of the challenges of creating um, a user interface that is based on a content standard, but using EAD XML as our metadata export standard, is that um, the encoded archival description fields are often much more granular than the content standard allows for. A good example of this is the physical description area, um, known as the extent to medium field in the IFAD template. In both the Canadian RAD standard, which we're looking at now, and the ISAD one, this is one large field. But in EAD, this can be um, handled in a bunch of granular fields. We've always had a challenge of figuring out how to reconcile these two. So in this new case, we've actually made it so advanced users who are interested can now add EAD tags directly to the field. So here I've actually encoded some of the stuff more granularly than the field normally allows. When I save the record, however, Adam will hide the tag so that the users don't see this. So now you've got a more granular EAD description without sacrificing the display. The last thing in terms of usability enhancements that I'd like to show you is our overhaul of the settings page. 
Previously, all the settings were in one long form. Now we've broken this up into individual sections to make it easier for readers to use and making it load faster. We've also made for all tables that are long in the application, we've made the header in it sticky. So as you scroll, the header will stay there, giving you context for the field that you're looking at. So now we're going to move on and take a look at the finding aid generation. You'll notice over here in our settings page that we have a new section here for finding aids. We have several options for configuring how our finding aids are generated. We can generate them in PDF or an editable RTF format. And we have two options for the finding aid model, either full details or inventory summary. The inventory summary will limit lower level descriptions, such as files and items, to a table like view in the finding aid. So if in your archival descriptions you have minimal details at lower levels, this is a good option to use. The full details, however, will give you the same full description for every level of description throughout. We'll start by generating one with the inventory summary. The last option here is to generate finding aid as a public user. This means that any fields in your, um, any descriptions that are drafts will be excluded. And if you are using the visible elements module to hide your physical locations, those will also be excluded from the finding aids generated. If, in fact, you're using this internally and you want to generate an editable one for Archivist to work with, you can turn this setting off. Be aware, however, that that will make the finding aids available to the public also include your draft information. So we suggest that if you're doing so, you remember to flip the setting back and regenerate your finding aid. So let's see what one of these finding aids looks like now. If I navigate to a description here, that's from children, you'll notice that over in the sidebar here, we have a new section called Finding Aid. Your public users will never see these options here. The only thing they will see is if you've generated one and there is a download link available, then this section will show up with a download button at the top level of the description. There are several statuses in there, which will be explained in detail in our documentation. But status unknown basically means that at this point, no finding aid has been generated. So let's generate one now. Once you start the task, this task is being performed asynchronously in the background, so it doesn't have the same timeout limitations of exporting or importing something to the user interface. We'll be showing you in a moment that we have a new jobs page where you can see those underway. Because this task is asynchronous, however, to see updates on the page, you'll have to refresh. We'll just quickly refresh this page. And now you'll see that we have a download available. Here's an example of the PDF finding aid that we've generated. These details here are taken from the Associated Archival Institutions contact area. A table of contents is generated, which will include hyperlinks to the different sections. Now, in this case, we just have series level with no file or items, so we're not seeing any file or items in this table view. We return to our settings page. We can try changing some of these.
And if I return to my description now, first thing that you'll notice is once you change some of the main settings, it's now looking for a finding aid based on those settings and it's not finding them, so it's going to indicate file missing to you. You can simply generate again once you change the settings. This time if I download, I'll actually be offered the RTF version, which can then be edited in an application. So now let's take a quick look at the jobs page. You'll find this under the manage tab. All authenticated users will have access to this page, but they will only be able to see jobs associated that they have generated themselves. An administrative user can see all jobs being performed and can clear all inactive. Here we can see some of the jobs that have been done. The two jobs that have been added in the 2.2 release are the ability to generate finding aids and the ability to inherit rights from top level descriptions down to lower ones. Sarah will be showing you that in a moment. In the future, we hope to add further jobs to this so that more tasks can be performed asynchronously in the background. If I return to another description here, and I start a large job, uh, You can return here. You can see this as it runs. Now, because this is running uh, to generate finding aids from the EAD XML, which is then being transformed into the format, that means that your EAD records need to be XML compliant. So there might be cases where you'll get an error because you've included something like an unencoded ampersand in your descriptions which uh, in strict XML formats, the browser will crash on. So make sure that if you're using special characters that you're escaping them in some of your fields. Now this page, like the other page, will not automatically refresh. However, we have added an option here called auto refresh. If you've engaged this, you'll see a check mark. It means that every five seconds, the page will automatically reload so that you can see jobs um, refresh themselves as they go. So there we can see that our job is completed successfully. If you'd like to keep this information for reference, we also have the option to export this in CSV format. Alright, I'm not going to show this at the moment, but it exports a simple CSV which includes all the columns here with the information so that you can keep that for administrative purposes. If you have a long list of jobs, a pager will appear, and you can always limit it to just active jobs over here. At the moment, we have no active jobs. If a job fails, it'll have an error message with a red icon here and some information as to why the job failed. Finally, we can clear finished jobs by clicking this button here. So now I'm going to pass the demonstration over to Sarah, who's going to walk us through some of the changes to our premise templates and the ability to pass those on. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to show you a couple of new things about the premise rights template in Adam 2.2, and we're really excited about these developments. First, I'm going to go to um, a description that Dan was just looking at. I'm going to refresh the page. 
And um, you can see here that this description has had a premise rights record added to it down below. So um, to add a premise rights record in Atom 2.2, you'll do this from the button bar, which is the area um, below where you go to edit or delete a record. You click more and you'd click create new rights. Because this record already has a right associated with it, you could also click the edit button to edit the rights record that is already there. So I'm going to create a new rights record. This will be um, familiar to uh, many of you who are familiar with premise rights or have used previous premise modules in Atom. You can choose the basis for your rights. We already had one associated with donor, so in this uh, particular collection, maybe we also want to add a right that has to do with copyright. So maybe we want to say that um, the copyright is um, unknown or in the public domain or under copyright. And you can add all of the usual details that you would want to add about um, its copyright status, including the date. And then you can add rights associated with um, the basis that you just um, described. So if we're saying that this particular collection is under copyright, perhaps we want to, to make a, uh, a right that has to do with, um, with replicating or displaying the content. And we want to say that it's conditional. We maybe want to give it a start date. And maybe add some notes, such as, let's seek permission of the copyright holder, something like that. We can keep adding more granted rights if we want to. Or we can just leave it as is. So now you can see that we have um, two different rights related with this record. One based on the donor's wishes and one based on copyright. The new, uh, one of the new features in Atom 2.2 is to be able to use those rights records to take actions on your digital objects. And what I mean by actions is deciding whether or not uh, your users can see the digital objects or not. I'm going to show you how to, to make the settings for uh, I go to admin, settings, and you'll see a, a new uh, settings area called permissions. So first, we need to choose which premise um, access permission you would like to make actionable. So um, in the default install, we have it as disseminate, but there might be a more appropriate um, action such as display or replicate at your institution. I'll leave it at disseminate for now. And when you create rights records, you'll have the option of saying that uh, dissemination and other rights are either allowed, disallowed, or conditional. You can get granular um, permissions for the digital objects by saying, I want um, under the allow conditions to say that my users can download masters, master uh, images, reference representations, and also view thumbnails. And you can toggle these between allowed and disallowed. So this is the default um, uh, settings as uh, Atom 2.2 is installed. Um, for allow, uh, users are allowed to do all of these things. They can allow, uh, they can download masters, see reference representations, as well as thumbnails. But you could change that, for, perhaps at your institution, you never want anybody to be able to download masters, so you could click disallow for that. For conditional, um, our default setting is um, to disallow master representation download, but to be able to view reference representations which are smaller than master copies typically, and also see thumbnails. And if you're set to disallow, then we've made all three um, all three disallow. Now I'm going to go add a new um, a new rights record to another archival description, and I have that archival description open in a different browser. 
So um, currently, this archival description does not have any rights associated with it. You'll notice in this browser, I'm not logged in. So this is what your public users would see currently. If we go back to our, our logged in site, and we find that description. So here's my whole level description. If I scroll down, you can see there are currently no rights associated with this description. If I click on uh, one of the item records within the poll, there are also no uh, rights records currently associated with the items within. If I wanted to, I could create the rights record for each item individually. But in this case, I'm going to show you how you can do it um, for all children or just digital objects throughout an entire poll. So that you don't have to do it over and over again for every digital object in the collection. So first, I'm going to create new rights. I'm going to say, uh, in this case, let's suppose that it has to do with um, a donor request. Donor has perhaps requested that uh, digital objects not be displayed. And I'm going to use the Disseminate Act because that is the act that we um, used in the settings to say that this would be actionable. And we're going to say that it is disallowed. You can give it a start date if you wish and do the end date or you can leave the end date open. I'm going to click save. So now my phone level description has a rights record which says that dissemination is disallowed. And I would like to add that rights record throughout all of these digital objects so that I don't have to do them one by one. I go back to the button bar to do this and I click manage rights inheritance. I have a couple of options here. You can apply the rights record to all descendants or you can only apply it to digital object descendants. That's what I'm going to choose. You can also choose to delete whatever rights records may have already existed in the children or keep those rights records and add the parent rights. In this case, it doesn't really matter which one I chose because the item records didn't have a rights record to begin with. I'll click apply. And this is one of those jobs that Dan is talking about. It's probably happened just as I have clicked the button and talked about it. Um, but um, Adam uses the job manager to uh, write the to write the rights records <laughs> to the digital objects. So now if I go back to that digital object and I scroll down, oh, the job perhaps is still working. <laughs> Let's check our jobs page and see what it's looking like. So, okay, we can see the, the job there. It should be finished. The rights should have been inherited. Let's go back and take another look. There we go. I did it just a little too fast. So now that the job has completed, the rights record has been added to the digital objects within this form. And check another. There we can see it again. So now that I've said that dissemination of these di digital objects are disallowed, if I'm not logged into the application, I'm just going to reload the page here in this other browser, you can see that we can no longer see the digital objects. We just see generic thumbnails instead. You'll notice there's uh, specific thumbnails for different kinds of objects. So PDFs have a little acrobat symbol, images have a little image um, icon. And if I click on the image, I get a message telling me why um, I can't see this digital object. As an administrator, you get to decide what this message says, and I'll show you how to do that. If we go back to our logged in version, 
and I'm going to go back to the settings page. If I click on user interface label, Adam users um, who are familiar with the application might remember that this is where you can change uh, a number of labels throughout the application. But we have a couple of new options here. Um, you have two different warnings that you can give. One is for when um, digital objects are not displaying because it's disallowed. And you can make a separate message if you wish for when digital objects have a conditional warning. This was based on the use case of the institution who sponsored this feature. They wanted to be able to distinguish between records that had not yet been reviewed um, through their privacy office for disclosure, and those get a conditional warning, as opposed to records that had been reviewed and um, access was definitely not allowed for privacy reasons, and those um, records get this, um, this disallow warning. So you can choose to have two different warnings if you want, or you could copy and paste the same message into both. I think that's your, your choice at your institution. So just a reminder in this case, what a, a non-logged in user sees when they're viewing this record is the same message that you've configured in the settings page in the user interface label. I'm also going to show you um, what it's going to look like when you browse digital objects. So um, a reminder, I'm back in the, the not logged in browser. I'm going to browse digital objects. And I'm going to do a different sort here just so that I find the digital objects that I just uh, took those actions on. Here we go. So uh, mixed in with the digital objects that you can see that we haven't applied any um, rights records to, you can see these generic icons are coming up. And these are part of that poll that we just, um, that we just added restrictions. So that is everything that I wanted to show you about the premise rights. We have one uh, new feature that we'll tell you about uh, during this sneak peek webinar, and that is a new genre taxonomy. I'm going to go to manage taxonomy. And again, Adam users um, who have used the taxonomy um, part of Adam before will be familiar with this, but this is where you can view the different kinds of taxonomies in Atom, including your levels of description, subject and cases, and so on. You'll notice there's a new one called Genre. And uh, this was sponsored by an institution who wanted it added to the RAD template. So for the time being, it's only available in the rules for archival description templates. Um, however, we would be very open to talking to institutions who are interested in sponsoring it for other templates. Um, and we pulled uh, a default list of terms from uh, the basic genre terms for cultural heritage materials from the Library of Congress. I'll just show you what that taxonomy looks like. So for um, RAD users, you might be familiar with the, the GMD, the general material uh, description. This is a little bit more, actually I'd say considerably more granular than that. Um, however, like all taxonomies in Atom, it's configurable. So if you decide that this particular taxonomy isn't useful to you, um, you could delete or replace these terms or add to them with something that's particular to your institution. And that's everything that we had to show you for today. I'm just going to close our, um, our display window here so that I can see your chat. And, um, oh, I hope that uh, I see a couple of people weren't able to uh, hear very well. We're sorry about that. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to watch our recording later. And um, there was a question about the message being customized, but we um, addressed that. Um, so if anybody has any other questions, feel free to pop them into the chat right now. And uh, we, we can spend the rest of our time answering questions. So while we're waiting for questions, to um, I will clarify one more thing as well. The, um, the new Finding Aid Generation as well has been sponsored by a Canadian institution. So for right now, 
it's generating those finding aids based on the rules for archival description template. If you've created a description in ISAD, you can still generate a finding aid, but the layout in the finding aid will look like the rules for archival description. So it's slightly different. Uh, we're really hoping to find an institution who will help us uh, develop that further so we can apply it to all the templates. The, there's a question if the finding aid reports will be an and or option. So will you, your users only be able to get RTF or PDF? And that is currently the case. Um, what you could do if you needed to generate an RTF, uh, like for internal purposes, but in general you want your users to get uh, PDFs, you could uh, switch the settings like Dan showed and then regenerate your PDF. Another uh, just kind of helpful hint for this um, for this uh, function when when Atom 2.2 is released, and this will be in our documentation. But when you update your archival descriptions, you add an accrual, you've added a new series, you have updated your description. That's another point in time where you, you'll want to regenerate your PDF so that it's up to date. It, the PDF um, has no ability to update itself as the description. It's stored uh, in the uploads folder, um, similar to where digital objects are kept internally in Atom. In the future, it would definitely be possible to make a drop down there so that the application would check which finding aids are available and then populate the menu so that if you had both an RTF and a PDF generated, that users could get to them. But currently, it'll just be depending on the global settings that you've set up in the finding aid section. Thank you. We think it's a great feature too. <laughs> We're pretty happy with, with how it's turned out. And it came, it's a great example of um, one institution uh, sponsoring the beginning of the feature and then a second institution had a need for the RTF and um, that got the ball rolling on expanding the feature a little bit. So um, there's, there's no reason why it can't change and evolve in future versions of the Atom as well. Are there any other questions? It looks like that might be all for today. Um, thank you so much for your time. And for those who missed it or unfortunately um, had audio problems, uh, we will upload the session to YouTube so that others can uh, watch and, and learn as well. At this point, we're working on internally doing the final testing and polishing of the release, and we hope to have it available for you next month. If you have any questions, feel free to um, post for us in our IC Adam user forum. Um, you're also welcome to play out on the demo site. And as soon as the release is done, Sarah and I have been working hard on making sure that the documentation for 2.2 will be available for you right away this time. Thanks very much for attending. Everybody have a great day.